Kuro, Part 1, The Anunnaki Alphabet Until the fall of the Tower of Babel, the biblical metaphor for the rise of the Empire of Babylon under the patron city-state deity Marduk, there was only one spoken language, understood by all people alive on earth at the time. In this lecture, we will follow how this original silent language of signs and symbols evolved into the modern-day Tarot, the lost language of the fallen gods, the Sumerian pantheon, the Anunnaki. We begin with the pre-diluvial Levant Natufians, ancestors of the Kebaran cave culture who dwelt near the Sea of Galilee. The Natufian tribes lived in massive proto-cities between 10,000 and 8,000 years ago, until the Deluge. The non-verbal, gestural, and guttural grunt and growl communication method shared by all animals on Earth in place of vocal cord dialects was enough of a framework for ancient people to communicate all the most complex concepts of society even as it exists to the modern day. This more directly telepathic method of communication allowed for early Homo sapiens to develop their minds in silence without feeling spied on by the minds of others or overseen by the all-seeing eye of God. Originally, signification, writing, epistemology, etc., evolved from a method of counting using one's fingers. Each phalange bone of each digit, besides the thumb, was counted, 1 to 12 in a specific order, and this formed the backbone of the first zodiac. Granted, the ancient Kebaran and Natufians would have only reckoned these as number sums, not by the complex method of numerological astrology we use today to attach meaning to the zodiac of twelve. Nonetheless, in the ancient art of palm reading, we find the origins of the first method of reckoning traits as sums in a list. The zodiac of twelve signs, as we know it now, did not, it is currently believed, exist in all its present detail until some five thousand years ago, after the flood. However, the use of the number-based system of twelve did occur in early counting systems, and this was the first inclination toward symbology in the mind of mankind. By simply counting one's own digits and palm mounds and hollows with one's opposable thumb, one has begun to invent written language and verbal communication. Because the ancients were aware of the twelve-base number system we dub today the zodiac, we cannot doubt they were also aware, by at least 5,000 years ago, of the various geometric implications of the 12 base symbol set slash number system. Because there are 12 symbols of the zodiac, and 12 exposed edges of two stacked cubes, signifying a single cube over time, we can begin to see the method of germination in the mind of early mankind of the psychic concepts we now call a Kabbalah. The five precursors to alphabetic language are therefore to be found alike keys hidden in the very pattern of one's own hand itself. The five symbols commonly used nowadays to test for telepathic potential are, in reality, prehistorically ancient in original usage. The circle, the cross, the square, the pentacle, and the flood sign or trinity are ancient symbols with nascently universal geometric applications. Contemporary to the development of this 12 base counting system and 5 symbol idealism was the later Paleolithic development by the Moksha, hunter-gatherer cave dwellers of the Siberian tundra of the method of rendering numerals as groups of slashes in patterns on tally sticks, allowing them to calculate mathematically using digits up to four placeholders, i.e. in the thousands. This form of complex math ushered in the Neolithic fascination with the stars and heavens, 
culminating in the worship of a pantheon of celestial gods. From the earliest calculations of the lunar month as 29 days to the Lubombo bone tally stick from 30,000 years ago, until the deluge 8,000 years ago, humanity evolved at a pace in harmonious tune with its environment, and we did so in the same silence as domestic pets use to communicate with one another today. The earliest ideograms are currently believed to be the 16 distinct Jiha symbols engraved on tortoise shells in China some 8,600 years ago. The depiction we see here is of a person outside a house being looked down on by a large eye. For 2,300 years, mankind remained in silence. Then, 7,300 years ago, we find the one side engraved small tablets recovered from Turdus, Transylvania, engraven with the Vinca symbols, considered a form of proto-writing. Contemporary to these, we find in Despilio, Greece, an engraven wooden tablet that contains a much more obvious form of proto-alphabet. Then came the flood, some 6,000 years ago. Next, 5,400 to 5,200 years ago, from the earliest Bronze Age, pre-Sumerian Mesopotamian culture of Uruk, the system of writing called cuneiform began to develop. Cuneiform arose as a pictographic system of more than 1,000 unique characters, However, by the era of the Late Bronze Age, post-Sumerian Ugaritic and Old Persian alphabetic ciphers, the alphabet of 27, 25, or 52 letters represents a later far more advanced form of use of this alphabetic script. Also from 5,300 years ago, in Egyptian Abydos, along the west bank of the Nile in Upper Egypt, come the earliest examples of proto-hieroglyphics, small inscribed clay tablets with untranslated pictographs on them from the era of Scorpion I, a pre-dynastic ruler of Upper Egypt. By the height of development of hieroglyphics in Egypt, Contemporary to the height of cuneiform writing in Mesopotamia, around 4,000 years ago, 24 specific uniliteral hieroglyphics evolved, accompanied by 103 biliteral, one glyph symbolizing a two-syllable sound, and at least 48 triliterals. 4,000 to 3,000 years ago, between the era of Minoan and Mycenaean rule in Crete, arose a twin pair of fully functional lingual syllabary written alphabets. Linear A and B both use essentially the same basic letters, however are written in two distinct dialectic languages. Linear A in Minoan and Linear B in Mycenaean. The linear letter languages consist of 87 syllabic combined consonant vowel sound letters as well as ideograms quantifying or qualifying the context of the written language. Although cuneiform and hieroglyphics both continued to be used in the Levant until at least 2,000 years ago, they would eventually wither away beside the use of the more conventional alphabetic precursor offered by Linear B. Although cuneiform signifies phonetic sounds as shaped symbols and hieroglyphics depict ideograms as combined sounds, Linear B represents letters as both pictographic ideograms as well as phonetic sound logograms. Cuneiform and hieroglyphics could express ideas in words, but neither alone could become the basis for phonetic alphabets that Linear B, by combining both, became. 
Next, arising from the Mediterranean port city of Byblos in Lebanon, some 3,800 to 3,500 years ago, comes a strange, undeciphered script that is presumed to be a syllabary. It contains examples side by side of at least six common hieroglyphics and no less than 11 later Phoenician alphabet letters. There are at least 90 and as many as 114 individual symbols in the Biblos syllabary and together comprise a text of 1,046 characters long. The Biblos syllabary, though undeciphered as yet, is believed to be the key to unlocking the origin of the Phoenician alphabet. From around 3,400 to 3,050 years ago, the first true alphabet appeared as the list of 22 Phoenician letters. These are credited with being the original mixed consonant and vowel alphabet of phonetic sounds cataloged as uniliterals, or single letters. The 22-letter Phoenician alphabet became the 22 letters of Aramaic, which became the 22 basic letters of modern Hebrew. The Phoenician alphabet became the 24-letter Greek alphabet and the 26-letter Etruscan alphabet of pre-Latin Italy. The 26-letter Etruscan alphabet would sire forth the 24 runes of Elder Futhark, and from the Latins who replaced the Etruscans, the Hellenistic Roman alphabet would be born. By the reign of Hammurabi, from 3,696 to 3,654 years ago, we find the establishment of the awful empire of Babylon, whose patron city-state deity was the mighty war god Marduk. At this time, as it is described in Genesis 11, 5 through 9, the Lord God came down upon the building of the Tower of Babel, and there he cursed us all to the dispersion of languages, the so-called confusion of the tongues. Tarot, Part 2 The River, a Game of the Gods Since the invention, some 5,000 years ago, of the first coin, the shekel, worth 180 ounces of grain, or 3.5 troy ounces in gold, one twentieth of a derrick. We have found the fun of pastime recreational games based on odds and statistics, which are truly at the cornerstone of all humanity's economic history, that can come only in the form of flipping a coin and letting chance decide our fate. The odds of any combination of coin flips, for example four or five heads or tails in a row, is increasingly unlikely as one adds further flips. But the odds of it being heads or tails are one to one, fifty percent either way each time. The next step up from the coin toss was the dice roll. The concept of dice is literally as old as its slang term now implies, with the knuckle bones of sheep being the precursor for the now common standard cube shape in Paleolithic Libya. By the time of the Roman Republic era, some 2,509 years ago, the standard cube shaped dice as we know them today had evolved and become widely used the world over. However, many of the dice used in the earliest board games of recorded history were not mere cube shapes, but included all five of the platonic solids as well. Many dice used during the eldest epochs of the ancient world were cylinder dice. The first form of board game now known to historians was the royal game of Ur, or the game of twenty squares, it was played with seven black and seven white player pieces, ten two-sided coins, and three tetrahedronal dice. Although the original rules of this game have been lost to the sands of time, it is believed its rules are the same as the slightly later, similar yet much more advanced, Egyptian game called Senet. Senet 
the game of passing, was the second post-diluvial form of the board game, also called the river. It dates from at least 5,100 years ago, and was played continuously through to the New Kingdom era, some 3,500 years ago. Its exact rules have since faded into obscurity. By the end of its popularity in Egypt, it had become a symbolic representation for the passage of the dead along the Amduat. This game is played with five pieces each by two players, and played on a board of three columns of ten rows. The five spaces represent the five archetypal deities of the Egyptian pantheon, Osiris, Isis, Thoth, Set or Typhon, and Horus. The five player pieces symbolize the position of these gods' respective planets relative to their starting places. Despite the apparent discrepancy in locations of origin, the rare Scandinavian game Daldos is similar to Senate, which later evolved into Hounds and Jackals. Hounds and Jackals and Daldos involve players proceeding upward along the outside columns and downward along the middle row, or vice versa, thus further indicating the original rule of Senate was to use the middle row as the only plane of motion on the board. An alternative form of portraying this central column's significance in the board's layout in the game of Senate is by comparing it to the contemporary Egyptian board game Mehen, meaning the coiled snake, also prevalent from 5,000 years ago. In the game of Mehen, the middle path, or royal road, of Senate is presented as a single spiral path. The goal is to race any number of player pieces along the coils inward and then back outward, or vice versa, as along the river row in Senate. The prevalence of the religious significance to the ancient Egyptian people of both these board games should not be underestimated. The Dendara zodiac inside the Temple of Hathor depicts the northern hemisphere constellations as they were recorded pictographically by the ancient Egyptians. Within their pattern is an unusual variance from exact observed positions of the stars in the constellation Draco, surrounding the circumpolar stars of the northernmost heaven's night skies. They appear to be arranged in the form of a Mehen board's spiral. While the game boards themselves have grown more complex in the Orient, and the player pieces less so, the opposite has held true in the West. In the East, there is Go, and in the West, Chess. In the East, there is Chinese checkers. In the West, there are playing cards. There should be no doubt by now that the earliest playing card systems evolved from the earliest chance and chase board games of the ancient world. The lost Egyptian Book of Thoth, depicting on its papyrus leaf pages the symbols of the lost alphabet, is the origin of what we call in modern times Tarot. Tarot, Part 3 The Hieroglyphic Syllabary Today, those who know of Tarot at all know of its relation to the Western Mystery School tradition. The so called occult, secret societies, and their studies of esoteric magic. To reduce the 22 trumps of the current deck of Tarot to a single system of relationships for all of them, we arrange them on the Tree of Life diagram of Hakabalah. However, as we students of Hakabalah know, also, this version is not the same as the original depiction of the Tree of Life. The modern, so-called Naples arrangement of the Golden Dawn, also used by Crowley, is a derivative of the RE, which in turn is a bastardization of the Gra, versions of the same structural lattice. Therefore, in dealing firstly with the 22 tarot trumps, we will be looking at the paths on the original 
Graw version of the Tree of Life diagram of Hakabalah and assigning them attributes, each leg or pathway, equivalent to each of the 22 trumps. The first of these shows us the location of each trump by its common, modern name. Note the placement of each trump card's attribute is vastly different from the Naples arrangement as a result of rearranging the traits on the original lattice. The second shows us a collection of names of the Sumerian pantheon, the Anunnaki. Each Anunnaki god or goddess is arranged according to which tarot trump trait they represent, and vice versa. The third shows us a collection of names of the Mayan pantheon, the Zibalbe. Note that there are 22 Zibalbe and 22 Sumerian Anunnaki, as well as 22 tarot trumps. This is not coincidental and has a lot, as we shall soon see, to do with the 22 letters of the Phoenician alphabet. The final formatted Tree of Life Gra arrangement diagram we shall examine for placing the Tarot Trump traits relative to one another shows us the letters of the alphabet that each Tarot Trump represents. Depicted are the alphabetic symbols from the Greek, the Hebrew, astronomical symbols, and Egyptian hieroglyphics. It is these traits we shall be examining individually next. Each is a collection of a set of attributes. We can thus compare them on the points of the Hebrew alphabet, the most commonly recognized and easily approachable modern version of archaic Phoenician, on the points of the Greek alphabet, alike the Hebrew, as both derive from Phoenician, and on the points of the astronomical symbols for the three elements, the seven planets, and the twelve signs of the zodiac, on the points of the pantheons associated with these attributes, and lastly, on the points of the Egyptian hieroglyphics depicting the original meaning of each Hebrew letter. Atu Zero, the Fool. The Hebrew letter Aleph is given in the upper right corner of the frame, representing the astronomical element air and the faithful consciousness of the 32 mystical paths of wisdom, according to the Sefer Yetzirah. Compare and contrast the shape of the Hebrew letter Aleph and the Egyptian hieroglyphic signifying the horns of a bull or oxen. Atu 1, Ninurta, the magician. The Hebrew letter is Pe and Greek vowel equivalent Epsilon. General consciousness is equivalent to the leg of the Tree of Life astronomically signifying the planet Mercury. Jaguar House is the Mayan Zibalbe of mercurial influence, and mercury relates to the magician Tarot Trump. The meaning of the Hebrew letter Pe is mouth, and so we have the Egyptian hieroglyph of a mouth. Atu 2, Nana, the Pope Joan. The Hebrew letter Beth, meaning house, is here juxtaposed with the Egyptian hieroglyphic of a house to symbolize the Mayan Zabalba Bay, cold house, of the worshipped consciousness, the Greek Val Alpha, as the Papus of the Moon. Atu three, Demuzi, the Gentle Shepherd. Ruler of the Mayan Bat House, Zibalba Bay, is Demuzi, who pursued Inanna into Hell as Orpheus and Eurydice of the Greek legends. Demuzi is ruler of the planetary influence of Venus which connects to the Queen or Empress Tarot Trump card. The Hebrew letter Kaf is symbolized as an open hand in the Egyptian hieroglyphic of open arms. The Greek equivalent letter is the vowel, Eta. Atu 4, Lamu, Demon of Jaundice, Apparative King or Emperor. The Hebrew letter of He is equivalent to the hieroglyphic of a window. I have here substituted an ujat, or fascination eye, symbolized by the right eye of Horus. The Greek letters are Alpha Nun in a pair, 
symbolizing the sign of Aries. Thus, Aries the ram of the zodiac is King Lamu, the demon of jaundice. Atu 5, Antu, blood gatherer of the Mayan Zabalba Bay, Pope or Hierophant over the sign of Taurus, glaring consciousness, the Hebrew letter Daleth and the Egyptian for a door bolt. The Greek letters are Beta, Xi. Atu 6, Tiamat, the bloody clod Zibalbe, governor over the sense consciousness, commands the zodiac twin sign of Gemini, the tarot trump the lovers, the Greek letter pair Rho Omicron, and the Hebrew letter Zayin, whose hieroglyphic equivalent is the scepter of the priesthood of death as a symbol. Atu 7, Kingu, the chariot trump over Cancer, Delta Pi, and Cheth, whose symbol is the slingshot weapon. Bloody Teeth, the Mayan Zabalbe, is of the same level as the stabilizing consciousness is among the 32 mystical paths of the Sefer Yetzera. Atu 8, Anshar, symbol of Libra, the balanced scales. Eta, Theta, are the Greek values equivalent to Lamed, the Hebrew letter symbolized by the ox yoke. The Mayan bone scepter Zibalbe holds aloft his will consciousness emanation. Atu 9, Lahamu, the Anunnaki, corresponds to the Mayan Zibalban, demon of pus. The Hebrew letter Yod corresponds to the Egyptian hieroglyph of an open hand. This symbolizes, or is meant to embody, the Virgo constellation and the Tarot Hermit Trump. The Greek letters coupled to the Hebrew are Zeta Epsilon. The hand of the demon of pus corresponds in turn to directing consciousness on the plane of formation. Atu 10, Enki, Anunnaki over the element of water, within the dark house Mayan Zabalba Bay, corresponds to the astronomical influence of the planet Jupiter governing the fortune trump according to the influx of natural consciousness. The letters are Hebrew, Cheth, Egyptian hieroglyphic fence logogram, and the Greek, Upsala. Atu 11, An, assigned the Hebrew letter Teth. The symbol is a twisting serpent in the Egyptian hieroglyphic, and this is, in turn, a symbol of Leo, the lion constellation in the zodiac. It corresponds to the strength, lust, tarot trump, renewing consciousness, scab stripper, the Mayan Zabalba, and the Greek letter pair Epsilon Rho. Atu 12, marking the crossing of the midway mark, is the letter Mem, signifying the alchemical element water, as symbolized by the bowl of water hieroglyphic. This is the consciousness of Sefer Yetzirah called palpable. Atu 13, Mamu, the wing Zibalba, symbol of Scorpio in the zodiac, and thus the death trump of the Tarot. Its Greek letter pair are Theta Upsilon, and its Hebrew letter is Nun, symbolized in Egyptian hieroglyphic by the living fish. Consciousness of influx abounds. Atu 14, Nibiru, the sign of Sagittarius, the archer, in the astronomical zodiac. The trump of art, enduring consciousness, signified by the Greek letter pair Iota Phi, the Hebrew letter Samak, and the Egyptian hieroglyph of a flail or prod. Atu 15, Apsu, the primordial begetter Anunnaki, equivalent to the Mayan underworld lord of the Zabalba Bay, the way of death, one death. The Greek letters Kappa Chai, couple the Hebrew letter Ayin, whose meaning is symbolized by the hieroglyphic of an eye, such as the mystery consciousness of Capricorn, the part goat, part fish zodiac sign, equivalent to the tarot trump, the devil. Atu 16, Nurgle, Anunnaki over Mayan razor house of the Zabalba Bay, the road of death. Continuous consciousness is the emanation whose planetary astronomy relates it to Mars. The Greek vowel Omicron and the Hebrew letter Gimel 
signified by the Egyptian mound hieroglyphic for camel, such as the Tarot Trump called the Lightning Struck Tower. Atu 17, Gaga, the Anunnaki version of Mayan pack strap, symbolizing the zodiac sign Aquarius. The Hebrew letter is Sadi, symbolizing a fish hook, while the Egyptian hieroglyphic depiction is of an ankh. The Tarot Trump is called the Star, and its glowing consciousness is symbolized by the Greek letter pair Lambda Psi. Atu 18, Kishar, Anunnaki pair of Zabalbin skull scepter, whose testing consciousness rules over the zodiac sign Pisces and the Tarot Trump of the Moon. Its Greek letters are Mu Omega, and its Hebrew letter is Kof symbolized by the profile of a man's head in the Egyptian hieroglyphic. Atu 19, Shamash Utu, the Anunnaki of the Sun, ruler of the planetary astronomical influence of the Sun, and correspondent to the firehouse Zibalba Bay. He is the Tarot Trump of the Sun, and his Hebrew letter is Resh, signifying a face. He is attributed the sole Greek vowel Iota. Atu-20 is the alchemical element of fire, akin to sulfur, and associated with the illuminating consciousness in the Sefer Yetzira. The Tarot Trump of the Aeon is applied to the Hebrew letter Shin, one of the three mother letters, which is, in turn, symbolized by the Egyptian hieroglyphic of a tooth. Atu-21 in Leo, the Zibalba Bay Crossroads, signifies the Tarot Trump of the Universe, the planetary influence of Saturn, the Greek vowel Omega, the Hebrew letter Vav, the hieroglyph for which depicts a nail. This is the conflagration of forces combining to form the sustaining consciousness attribute. Such are the 22 Tarot Trumps presented here as an alphabetic syllabary combining Greek, Hebrew, Egyptian hieroglyphic, and astrological meanings. Thus also are the 22 names of Anunnaki and Zabalba Bay attached to them. Altogether, they comprise the first syllabary to definitively link the Phoenician alphabetic sums to the Egyptian hieroglyphic pictures in a meaningful manner for all 22. The order I presented these here was in the order of the Trumps only. Tarot, Part 4, Ancient and Modern Comparing only the most recent and the original ideograms of the 22 tarot trumps as a hieroglyphic syllabary yields a wide margin of time within which for the more subtle nuances in the evolution of the tarot trumps meaning to get lost. However, we shall be comparing only the original hieroglyphic with its oldest associated attributes to only the most modern Tarot Trump versions. This will indeed show the same form of evolution as could be seen to occur over a more gradual span, looking at all the decks in between. However, it will prove a starker contrast by which to measure the similarities of attribute between the modern Tarot Trump images and their original hieroglyphic symbolism. We will be comparing the original glyphs first to the Tarot Trumps designed according to the descriptions given in the Golden Dawn cipher manuscripts. It is important to note these cipher manuscripts only describe certain cards, the Trumps, from among the entire deck released by the Golden Dawn group itself. Thus, while these Trumps are authentic to the Golden Dawn tradition, the images on the remainder of the cards are to be seen more as the invention of A.E. Waite, who designed them based, in part, on original pictures by L.F.S. Levy. Secondly, we will compare each hieroglyphic original of the Tarot Trumps to the versions designed by Alastair Crowley, the Golden Dawn Dropout, and O.T.O. Ipsissimus. While the purpose, according to Waite, for the Golden Dawn Tarot deck was to forward the mystery tradition, specifically by packaging the ordinary playing card deck with the trumps as a means of reinvigorating New Age interest in Tarot. 
Aleister Crowley's purpose was to remove the Golden Dawn deck from primary significance in that regard, and to distill the significance of the symbolism of the Tarot trumps, specifically by adding more correspondent symbols to each image. Bear these motives of 20th century men in mind as we compare their respective works of art as reception of the original hieroglyphic message intended behind the Tarot. Atu Zero, the Fool. The first letter was Aleph, and the shape of the Aleph was based on the shape of the Egyptian hieroglyphic of bull or ox horns. Thus, the original shape of the letter in the hieroglyphic syllabary was kept as a key to decoding all the world's ancient writing systems in the Library of Alexandria, Egypt. The shape of this letter eventually became transformed into the image of the Fool card in modern Tarot. Here we see the Golden Dawn version of the first Tarot trump, so ingrained on our current collective consciousness as a quite unique piece of art entirely apart from the simple hieroglyph from which its shape originally derived. The Tarot has become in modern times a collection of anthropomorphications of the letters of Hebrew and their original hieroglyphic meanings. Thus, the symbolic signification of the letter Aleph is now a depiction of a young traveler standing on a precarious cliff face over a tumultuous ocean, with the sun and a small dog behind him. However, if you look very closely, you will see the image of the bullhorn hieroglyph hidden in the pack strap of his knapsack. Aleister Crowley was no stranger to the hieroglyphics of Egypt, nor to the original meanings of the Hebrew letters. He also incorporated his knowledge of the Torah as a hieroglyphic syllabary into his deck's depictions of the trump cards. However, because he was following the tradition begun before him by the Golden Dawn deck, he was forced to compromise his imagery between the original syllabary symbols and the anthropomorphic depictions in the Golden Dawn Tarot deck. His symbolism of the Fool card reflects some additional symbolic elements associated with the original letter, as well as more closely resembles the letter in its figure. Atu 1, The Magician the hieroglyphic rendition of the original meaning of the Hebrew letter Pe was a mouth, however the Egyptian hieroglyph of a mouth symbolized silence. Thus, the earliest conception of the trait equivalent to the planetary attribute of Mercury was the silent psychopomp who led the dead through the valley of shadows towards the light at the end of the tunnel in the rebirth from the underworld ritual of primitive superstitious shamanism. That the letter Pe and the corresponding hieroglyphic apply to the planet Mercury, and thus to the magician trump card of Tarot, are calculated according to a variant method from that used by the Golden Dawn, who associated the letter Beth, Hebrew for B, with the planet Mercury, and who thus associated the magician card with the letter Beth, whose meaning was house. However, regardless of having ordered the correspondent Hebrew letter differently, the essential hieroglyphic trait is still the emphasized aspect of the anthropomorphic depiction of the letter. In the Golden Dawn Magician card, the robed young male holds up a candle burning at both ends and points downward with the other hand. Before him on a table are the four essential instruments. Crowley's magician card associates Mercury with Beth also. However, Crowley was no stranger to the mysterious demi-deity of Egypt, Horpakrat, called Harpocrates in Greek, the archetypal god of silence, associated with the concept in magic of not revealing one's methods to the uninitiated. Crowley's image is of Hermes the fleet-footed messenger, Greek god surrounded by the elements of art. Atu 2, the Papist. 
Because the original order of letters in the Hebrew alphabet was different from the order in which they were at the time the Golden Dawn Tarot deck was made, we find the original placement of the letter Beth, Hebrew B, as third in the syllabary as it corresponds to the traits of the Tarot. Beth, meaning house, was a feminine letter and used in names like Bethany and Bethlehem, meaning house of God. Thus, it is associated with the female character of the High Priestess, Pope Joan, or Papist Card. The usual depiction in the Golden Dawn deck, regardless of having the letter Gimel, Hebrew G, in place of the letter Beth, retains the essential hieroglyphic meaning of house rather than camel. The twin pillars behind the anthropomorphic letter Beth have the letters J and B on them, symbolizing a mystery known best to Freemasons. However, the mystery deepens considering the transposition of the letter Gimel, juxtaposing the letter Beth. The Crowleyan rendition of the priestess shows the dilemma most clearly by minimizing the image of the camel, the meaning of the letter Gimel, beside the image of the priestess, shown waving a vast net upon an immense loom, symbolizing the feminine household. Again, the modern images cannot escape their hieroglyphic origins. Atu III, the Empress. Again, the letter is out of order from the original Hebrew alphabet of the Tarot as a hieroglyphic syllabary in the modern versions, and so we find the attribute of Venus, attributed to Kaf, Hebrew K, in the original syllabary, but to the letter fourth in the sequence in the modern Hebrew alphabet, which at the time of the Golden Dawn's reformation of the Tarot, was the letter Daleth, Hebrew letter D. Thus, though the letter Daleth signifies a door, a door is not shown in the image presented for the Empress card in the 22 Tarot Trump deck. Instead, the image is based on the original hieroglyph signifying the outstretched open hand hieroglyphic comparable to the letter Kaf rather than to the door signified by the letter Daleth. Here we see the Golden Dawn version of the Empress image, a rose pattern robed young woman holding out a short scepter and seated in a wheat field. It should be significant, also, to associate the Anunnaki character trait Demuzi with the wheat and fir trees surrounding the recumbent empress in the Golden Dawn image. Tammuz, the Persian version of Sumerian Demuzi, represented a psychopomp alike Hermes, however, was venerated by the seasonal holiday of harvesting the wheat before winter. That Demuzi is male, and Venus traditionally female, is also significant to the use of the rose symbol in the Golden Dawn deck to symbolize a greater concealed mystery. Thus, the Empress, in her cloak of many mysteries, may symbolize not the hermetic hermaphrodite, but a male rather than female god. Here we see the Crowleyan version of the Empress. Again, as throughout, we will see Crowley's images littered with superfluous symbols, copiously cross-referenced and checked to correspond to one another according to Crowley's lugubrious charts in 777, which only makes sense if you understand the confusion between the original hieroglyphic syllabary letter signified by the anthropomorphic character as opposed to the affiliated attributes of the letter in that place in the modern Hebrew alphabet. Here we see correspondent attributes of the planet Venus. While the door of Daleth might be implied in the uppermost archway, the outstretched arms hieroglyph is here mimicked almost perfectly in the character. Atu IV, the Emperor. The hieroglyph most useful to depict the idea symbolized by the Hebrew letter He, attributed to the Emperor Tarot Trump card, is debatable. I have here chosen the right eye of Horus, Ra, 
to symbolize the window meaning of He. The reason for this is the ancient saying, the eye is the window to the soul, and the Egyptian concept of fascination or the evil eye, mal occhio. The window concept in itself is not evil, however possesses more symbolism depending on whether one is inside or outside of it. In this same sense it is said, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. The golden dawn image for He, the window, plays heavily on the association of this letter with Aries, usually the starting sign of the regular reading of the astrologic zodiac. We see the emperor, an old man with a long white beard wearing a crown and holding an Ankh scepter, seated on a stone-carved throne decorated with four ram's heads, the symbol of Aries. Crowley's depiction of the emperor preserves the mirroring of posture and contraposition of colors with the empress, and, like the Golden Dawn depiction, positions prominently the symbol of the ram. Atu V, the Hierophant. The letter Daleth appears here in the original order of the Hebrew alphabet, correlated in the hieroglyphic syllabary with the Egyptian hieroglyphic correspondent to the symbolic meaning of the Hebrew letter. Daleth, symbolizing a door, is here approximated by the Egyptian hieroglyph for a door latch or lock. Daleth is the letter in the original syllabary, and Vav is the letter equivalent in the modern Hebrew alphabet. And while Daleth means door, Vav means nail. Again, the reordering of the alphabet can change only part of the overall imagery of the Tarot Trump, yet cannot change the essence of the original letter and hieroglyph, which remain in some form implied within the symbolism anyway. In this case, although the correspondent Hebrew letter is believed to be Vav, meaning nail, the symbolism of the Hierophant card are the crossed keys of the Catholic papacy. We see the Hierophant seated between two large columns on a step up from two supplicant friars. Crowley's depiction of the Hierophant focuses heavily on the correspondence of the card's attributes to those of the zodiac sign Taurus. We see featured his depictions of Hathor and of the Babe of the Abyss. The Hierophant is depicted seated inside a stelloctahedron, surrounded by a bull and two elephants. The symbols in the corners of the image show the four elements. Behind the Hierophant's yellow hat sect crown is a rose again signifying a greater concealed mystery. Atu 6, The Lovers Zayin, the Hebrew letter Z, appears next in both the original hieroglyphic syllabary and the later rearranged alphabetic anthropomorphications of the letter versions of the 22 Tarot Trumps. The image of Zayin is meant to symbolize the Egyptian hieroglyphic depiction of a crook, and so we see the Anubis-headed staff or wand is a symbol of both death and directed power. However, because the zodiac symbol associated with the letter placement in the syllabary deck alphabet is the more commonly recognizable sign of the twins, Gemini, the symbolism of the coupled pair overwhelms the symbolism of the weapon in the later imagery. We see in the Golden Dawn version a young and perfect Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Eve stands before the Tree of Life, surrounded by the perching serpent, while Adam stands before the fiery Tree of Knowledge, Above them, the Angel of Revelations appears beneath a bright solar disk. Likewise, the Lover's Card in Aleister Crowley's Thoth Tarot deck features the aspects attributed to the zodiac sign Gemini, the Twins, prominently. However, in Crowley's version, there is also a strange homage to Zayin in the form of the Angel of Revelations, who appears above the wedded couple as a hooded, 
long, white-bearded old wizard. However, mostly the imagery of both modern tarot cards excludes all symbolism of the original hieroglyph the corresponding Hebrew letter was based on, preferring instead to rely heavily on the symbolism of the zodiac sign. Atu 7, The Chariot The Egyptian hieroglyphic depiction that most resembles the Hebrew letter Cheth does not have the same meaning as the meaning usually attributed to Cheth as a symbol. The usual meaning of Cheth is a fence, and the Egyptian hieroglyph most closely resembling the shape of the Hebrew letter is the symbol of a weapon, in specific a slingshot. However, that makes little difference in the subsequent symbolism of the tarot deck imagery, which focuses mainly on the chariot as a word representing the letter cheth, and then the imagery revolves around the chariot symbol itself. Not even the crab symbol of the zodiac sign cancer shows. Instead, in the Golden Dawn decks version of the Chariot Tarot Trump card, originally derived from the Hebrew letter Cheth and the hieroglyph of a slingshot, the Metatron is depicted in his throne chariot, the Hekelah Merkaba, symbolizing the sun by its yellow wheels and winged disc symbol, and symbolizing day and night by the twin sphinx who tow the Metatron's chariot meant to resemble the shape of the letter Cheth and the hieroglyph symbol of the slingshot. The chariot itself is hooded by an overhung veil, painted to resemble the stars of heaven. Aleister Crowley's depiction of the chariot of Cheth and the zodiac sign of the crab is essentially identical to the layout of the Golden Dawn version, with few differences in detail. The voice of God is wearing golden armor and towed by four mythical animals signifying the four elements. The charioteer holds a spinning orb. Atu 8. Justice The symbol of the cattle goad was the Hebrew letter Lamed, symbolized thus hieroglyphically by the oxen's yoke. However, the symbol of Libra the zodiac sign with which the letter Lamed is associated in Hakabalistic tradition, is the scales of weights and measures. Thus, once again we see, though the symbols appear somewhat similar in shape and design, the ox yoke and the scales are unique symbols from one another, and it is the symbol of the scales of the sign of Libra that the subsequent artists of the Tarot's symbolic syllabary chose to focus on. So, the relevant tarot card is justice, symbolizing the scales of the zodiac sign Libra. Although this is card 11 in the trump deck of the Golden Dawn, Aleister Crowley, in his Book of Thoth, explaining his tarot deck's layout, elaborated on the reason for it being misplaced in the sequence of trumps in the Golden Dawn deck. In Aleister Crowley's deck, Adjustment, the equivalent of Justice in the Golden Dawn deck, substitutes for the 8th trump in the Golden Dawn sequence, and likewise the 8th trump in the Golden Dawn deck is substituted later for the 11th card in the regular arrangement. In the original Golden Dawn layout, Libra and Leo were reversed. Atu 9, The Hermit the Hebrew letter Yod is meant to signify the closed hand, or fist. The nearest approximate Egyptian hieroglyph to this ideogram is that showing an open hand. The sign of the zodiac related to the hermit card is Virgo. However, neither the literal interpretation of Yod as a hand, nor the attributes of Virgo, the zodiac sign, are the focus of the imagery of the usual hermit card. In the Golden Dawn Deck's version of the image, the hand of the hermit is significant in the composition, insofar as it is holding aloft a lamp containing a hexagram. However, the hermit also holds a walking staff, and wears a hood and long white beard, which are attributes of the traits of Virgo, 
only if perverted to an extremity of old age in the form of the mad prophet who lives in a cave archetype. Once again, Crowley's card shows little significant modification from the Golden Dawn motif in the case of the Hermit. While the old man was garbed in gray in the Golden Dawn Dex image, he is garbed in red in Crowley's version. He holds the hexagram lamp low in Crowley's version to lead the three-headed dog Cerberus of Greek myth who guards the entrance to hell. Atu 10, Wheel of Fortune The Hebrew letter He resembles the letter Cheth, and so the original meaning of He was also offense. Thus, the Egyptian hieroglyphic assigned to, to He is the one most closely resembling offense. He was associated with Jupiter, and Jupiter in turn with the fortune card. However, the modern letter of the Hebrew alphabet assigned to the fortune card and the planetary influence of Jupiter in modern times is Kaf, K. The meaning of Kaf is an open hand. However, look to the art of the modern Tarot trump card of fortune and find the ideogram of an open hand. Instead, the image will symbolize the originally Egyptian hieroglyph of a fence, and thus of the letter He. The Golden Dawn trump card of fortune depicts the, originally Buddhist, concept of the wheel of karma and reincarnation in a manner acceptable symbolically to the Western mind of the 20th century. The four elemental animorphs study from open books in each corner, surrounding the three sattvas, Vedic elements, rooster, snake, and pig, depicted as the three alchemical states, salt, sulfur, and mercury, of the adversary archetype, the descending snake, the ascending Satan, and the siegent royal Lucifer. The English letters inside the wheel spell tarot, clockwise, and Torah, counterclockwise. The Hebrew letters are the Tetragrammaton, four-letter name of God. Interspersed, that is, all read as one, the English and Hebrew letters spell the name Thaure. Inside these letters are four symbols on an X-form cross. The symbols signify lowermost water, uppermost mercury, left salt, and right sulfur. Crowley's Thoth Tarot version of the Trump Card of Fortune depicts a ten-spoked wheel surrounded by three attributes of Thoth, the Sphinx atop the wheel, the crocodile descending clockwise, opposite from in the Golden Dawn deck, and the baboon ascending. Atu 11, Passion the twelfth letter in the original hieroglyphic syllabary's order for the Hebrew alphabet was the letter Teth, and the letter Teth was symbolic of a twisting snake. There are two Egyptian hieroglyphic versions showing a twisting snake image. This one depicts the horned viper indigenous to ancient Egypt. The twisting snake glyph eventually morphed into the symbol of the zodiac sign Leo, the lion, Thus, the ideas of the snake and the lion have long been associated, especially in Egypt, where Ra Horus was symbolized by the lion and Set Typhon by the snake. In the Golden Dawn Tarot deck's eighth trump card depiction of strength, we see a maiden symbolizing the preceding zodiac sign of Virgo petting a lion. In the Crowley and Thoth Tarot deck's 11th trump card depiction of lust, we see the Whore of Babylon riding on the back of a many-headed lion. Atu 12, The Hanged Man The Hebrew letter Mem, equivalent to the Roman English letter M, the Hebrew letter Aleph, the Fool Atu, and the Hebrew letter Shin, Roman English phoneme sh, 
are called in Hakabala the three mother letters because they occur at the beginning, the middle, and the end of the Hebrew alphabet. Because of their positions in the alphabet as the three mothers, these three letters were each assigned an elemental attribute, while the rest of the letters in the alphabet were either planetary or zodiacal. Thus, Mem was the mother of the water element. As with the fool Atu, and as we shall soon see, the Atu of the letter Shin, the Golden Dawn Tarot deck's depiction of the character for the card for the hanged man focuses primarily on the trait of his title and does little or nothing to suggest the elemental or alphabetical traits. We see a man with his hands bound behind him, tied in a T-shaped tree by his right ankle with a halo. Much has been speculated about the posture of this character as his left leg crosses at the knee behind his right leg. However, as we see in Alistair Crowley's depiction of the hanged man Atu, the left leg is bound while the right is crossed in front, entirely opposite of the Golden Dawn depiction. Thus, there is less meaning implied by the posture of the legs in the Golden Dawn deck than implication of the water element in Crowley's depiction. We see the hanged man of Crowley's deck is hung from an inverse onchiroglyph, symbolizing life, is pierced with nails through his right foot and both hands, and is bald and naked. Below him is a twisting serpent, and behind him a blue square of seventeen rows and columns. At 13, Death. The significance of the Hebrew letter Nun is not the hieroglyphic image of a fish that defines it, but the concept of living or moving that describes the letter's trait. This contradicts the title of the Tarot card, or Atu, associated with this letter. In the Golden Dawn's depiction of the meaning of the letter Nun as not life, but the opposite of life, death itself, shows a skeleton in black armor astride a pale horse. Death holds a black flag on which is a white rose signifying a mystery. In the distance are two towers and a sunset. Beneath the horse's hooves lies the dead king, his crown being trampled. A man in the robes of the Christian Pope prays to death on behalf of a woman and child. In Aleister Crowley's depiction of the same concept, a black skeleton wearing an Egyptian crown weaves with a scythe on a long loom, a double helix spiral. Above an eagle, below a scorpion, signifying the zodiac sign attributed to this etu. Behind the skeleton is a snake, and beneath it a fish, signifying the letter Nun. Atu 14, Serenity. The Hebrew letter Samak symbolized a prop or flail. The Egyptian hieroglyph for this is a forearm and hand holding a crop or short whip. The relative zodiac sign was Sagittarius, the archer. In the Golden Dawn's depiction of the Temperance Atu, we find the Angel of Revelations depicted again, here pouring water upward from one cup into another, symbolizing the alchemical elixir of immortality. The angel stands with one foot on the shore and one in the sea, as described in the Book of Revelations, and behind on the horizon is a crown halo above a narrow winding pass between twin mountain peaks. In Alistair Crowley's depiction of the Art Atu, a green-robed, two-faced woman mixes water poured from a cup using a wand made of fire into a large golden bowl, on either side of which are an albino lion and a red eagle, symbolizing the phoenix. Atu 15 the Devil. 
The original meaning of the Hebrew letter ayin was an I, and the Egyptian hieroglyphic of the I corresponds to the Hebrew letter ayin. Neither of these in itself is significant of the devil concept, which originated at the same time as the earliest civilizations and records of history. The devil atu is also associated with the fish goat zodiac sign of Capricorn. Only by combining all these concepts in a negative light can we begin to see the origins of the devil atu's symbolic imagery. In the Golden Dawn Devil card, we see the depiction, originally by Eliphaz Levi, of Baphomet as goat-headed and hooved, but with the torso of a man, here shown with bat's wings. The inverse pentagram is his crown, and he holds up the sign of Vulcan and downward a lit torch. To his cubic throne are chained the demonized versions of Adam and Eve, with tails symbolizing the trees of life and knowledge. In Aleister Crowley's rendition of the Devil Atu, we see the scapegoat of Mendes also depicted, with long horns resembling those of Egyptian mat, wear of the scales over heaven or hell floating in front of an erect phallus whose two testicles show the genomic separation into four males and four females. Atu 16, The Lightning Struck Tower Although it occurs third in the current Hebrew alphabet, originally the letter Gimel was the 17th letter in the hieroglyphic syllabary and originally signified a camel. Since no Egyptian hieroglyphic is known that specifically signifies the camel, the closest approximation to one shape is believed to be this humped hill shape. The 16th Golden Dawn Atu, Tarot Deck Card, depicts a tower atop a hill. The tower is being struck by lightning, symbolizing the power of war, Mars being the planet associated with this Atu. The tower itself symbolizes the power of authority, the crown on top overturned by the lightning bolt. From the tower's three flaming windows fall a king and a pope. The 16th Atu of Aleister Crowley's Thoth Tarot deck depicts essentially the same scene, though stylized highly abstract. A castle tower falls beneath a river of flame emanating from an eye in the sky. The letter Ayin, recall, signifies an eye and occurs 17th in the current Hebrew alphabet. A dove, a haloed serpent, and a mouth breathing fire surround the central theme as additional symbolic images. Atu 17, the star. The Hebrew letter Tzadi, symbolizing the phoneme of soft C, was meant to symbolize a fishhook. The Egyptian hieroglyph of the fishhook was a two-legged upside-down ankh, that is, a five-pointed figure with a loop for one point. This Atu aligned with the zodiac sign Aquarius, significant also of the water element. The star Atu of the Golden Dawn Tarot deck shows seven smaller eight-point stars around a single larger one. Below these sits a bird in a tree in the distance behind a blonde woman pouring water from two small jars, one onto water and one onto land. She kneels with one foot on the surface of the pond. Due to a peculiar quote from an Egyptian stele transposed by Aleister Crowley, he made much fuss in arranging his system of Tarot trumps so as to render the star Atu subjective epistemologically, yet seems to have forgotten the entirety of the modern Hebrew alphabet is no more so set in stone than his juxtaposition of Tzadi for Cheth. The image is of a bathing blue woman pouring two cups. 
Beyond the horizon is a planet with a seven-point pole below a star with seven points. Add to 18, the moon. The Hebrew letter Kof, Romanized English letter Q, was meant to depict the back of a head or a face in profile. The corresponding Egyptian hieroglyph shows exactly this, the face of a male head in profile. It corresponds to the zodiac sign Pisces, which is usually symbolized by twin fish, and the Atu is called the moon. The connection between all these symbols is simple, relating to monthly tide cycles affected on Earth's oceans by our moon. In the Golden Dawn Tarot deck depiction of the Atu of the moon, we see a quarter moon surrounding the profile of a face, symbolizing a lunar over solar eclipse. A long, narrow, winding path leads towards mountains on the horizon between two towers, each with one window, and ends in a beach in the foreground. A lobster crawls out of the ocean onto the path, and on either side of the shore sit two jackals braying at the lunar event. In Aleister Crowley's version of the moon at whose depiction, we see two lighthouses, each girded by an Anubis, holding an Ankh. At their feet is a shoreline below which is a scarab beetle, rolling up a solar disk surrounded by blue and red waves. Between the towers in the sky is the shape of a triple-looped torus, in the middle of which are red and blue ribbons, raining down light to the submerged solar disk. Atu 19, the Sun. By subtracting part of the linear form of the letter Kof, Hebrew Q, we turn the symbol it represents, the back of the head, around to the front to yield the letter Resh, Hebrew R, and the Egyptian hieroglyph meaning a head seen facing front. The planetary aspect from the symbols of astronomy, the sun, eclipses any other meaning in the title of the card. In the Golden Dawn depiction of the Tarot Trump for this Egyptian hieroglyph, we see the sun's face head-on, surrounded by rays and waves of light, above flourishing sunflowers growing on a brick wall. A young child wearing a crown of flowers and holding a red banner sits on the back of a pale gray horse. Aleister Crowley's depiction of the Tarot Trump for the hieroglyph that became the Hebrew letter Resh is equally overshadowed by solar symbolism, and rather than a face, shows two cherubim before a small, crowned, grassy hill below a solar disk and surrounded by the twelve astrological signs of the zodiac. Atu 20, the age. The letter Shin, next to last in the modern and the ancient order of the Hebrew alphabet, was the third and final of the mother letters, representing elements rather than planets or signs of the zodiac. Shin is the mother letter of the element fire, and the letter itself is meant to symbolize teeth. The Egyptian hieroglyphic of a single tooth is shown for comparison. The Atu combining these symbolic attributes into one image is the Golden Dawn's depiction of the judgment, according to the expectation of a rapture at the end of days, when the Angel of Revelations blows the seventh horn, and all the dead rise from their graves to sit in judgment of the living. The Atu combining these symbolic attributes into one image in Crowley's tarot deck is his depiction of the Aeon, an idea he misinterpreted from the Gnostic concept for the 2,000-year solar span of a sign of the zodiac. According to Crowley's idea of history, man had been around for only two eons already, and was only beginning in 2000 AD to enter into the third. He called these the aeons of the mother, the father, and the crowned and conquering child. Here we see these three ideas depicted as Nuit, Thoth enthroned, and Harpocrates, who is neither seen nor heard. 
Below these is the Hebrew letter Shin, shown. Atu 21, Cosmos. The final letter of both the modern and ancient Hebrew alphabet is the letter Tau, signifying the phoneme T. Its shape symbolizes a T-square or cross, and its Egyptian hieroglyph depicts a nail. The final astronomical attribute of all is Saturn. The Golden Dawn Atu, the World card, shows a young woman robed with a purple banner juggling two batons, a flame at both ends of each, surrounded by a wreath outside of which are the animisms of the four elements. The final Atu of the Trumps in Aleister Crowley's Tarot deck, the Universe card, shows a golden figurine trampling the head of a serpent, holding aloft its tail in two coils toward a golden eye in the surrounding night sky. Behind this figurine is a Trephile Mobius strip, and around the corners are the four elemental animals. Tarot, Part 5, A Lesser Arcana, and Complete Deck Just as to assemble the twenty-two trumps on a lattice structure, we arrange them as the three horizontal, seven vertical, and twelve diagonal paths on a Hakabalistic Tree of Life diagram. So too can the complete deck be arranged on the combinations of the Gras tradition of the Tree of Life diagram of a Tesseract Hypercube with Steve Savedow's Tree of Death diagram of a Stelloctahedronal Hypertetrahedron. When we do this, we find there are 32 mystical paths of wisdom connecting 10 sephirot to 7 chakras. If we add the entire system as one complete element, we sum 50 natural attributes on this chart, and if we double the attributes of the original 22 trumps, we achieve the mystical number 72, the original intended sum for the attributes now assembled as the tarot deck of 78. The usual number of cards in a standard modern tarot deck, the Lesser Arcana, differs from the number of cards in a regular playing card deck. There are four royal cards for each of the four suits, each numbered Ace, 2 through 10 in usual tarot, totaling 56 cards. There are only three royal cards per four suits of 10 cards each in a standard deck of playing cards, and the aces count as royals. Thus, there are a total of 52 cards in a regular playing card deck. This implies the number of lesser arcana in the tarot deck may indeed be malleable, and instead of 56 cards, total instead only 50. Although we studied the imagery of the 22 major arcana tarot trumps, because we were relating them to the original hieroglyphic syllabary of the Anunnaki language, that broke apart into the various phonetic alphabets at the time of the confusion of the tongues and the rise of ancient Babylon, we will not be studying the modern tarot depictions of anthropomorphic characteristics of the 56 lesser arcana of the regular deck. Suffice it to say that there are traits attributed for each by the Golden Dawn deck, but that only the original 22 trump traits are described in the original cipher documents upon which the Golden Dawn was founded. These 22 correspond to the paths on the Tree of Life, the Hebrew letters, and all their other relative attributes. Each of the four suits of the classic deck had in the Golden Dawn Tarot arrangement, an ace card, followed in suit by a two, a three, and so forth, until the ten card appears last. Next, each suit was followed by four royal cards, including a prince, knight, queen, and king. The four usual suits of Tarot were labeled cups, wands, swords, and coins or pentacles. These differ from the modern suits in the standard deck of playing cards used today, given as clubs, spades, hearts, and diamonds. 
Usually the suits are seen as corresponding to one another. Thus, cups equals hearts, wands equals clubs, swords equals spades, and coins equals diamonds. So, we see in the common decks of today an agreement on the 40 numbered cards, including aces as ones, of the four suits of ten cards each. These 40 are unalterable attributes of the decks, however the number of royal cards differs between the tarot decks where there are four royal cards per suit, and the usual playing card decks where there are only three royal cards per suit. Thus, to the usual base of 40 cards, we can add any other number of royal cards per suit to complete the deck. Next, let us consider the 50 letters of the Sanskrit alphabet. These were, just like the 22 Hebrew, Greek, Phoenician letters, an independently invented alphabet of phoneme sounds equally ancient in origin. They derive from between the Proto-Ganges script and the pre-Hindu Vedic period in the Indian subcontinent. In the same way, the 22 phonetic letters of Middle Eastern origin correspond to hieroglyphs, Hebrew letters, zodiac signs or planets of astronomy, etc. So these 50 Sanskrit letters have their correspondent traits in both the ancient Sumerian and the ancient Egyptian civilizations contemporary to its origin, and when they are combined with the 22 trump letters, form an alphabet of 72 atu. The 50 Sanskrit letters of the Vedic era Indian subcontinent corresponded in Sumeria to the post-Tower of Babel construction project, Babylonian Empire's 50 names of their patron deity Marduk. These were originally listed in the Enuma Elish, the Babylonian adaptation of the Sumerian Bible the Book of Enki. They represent the Babylonian era replacements for the original names of 50 unique deities in the Sumerian pantheon of the Anunnaki. At a cocktail party in the 1970s AD, a group of occultish H.P. Lovecraft fans drafted 50 sigils for these 50 names and released their work as a modern addendum to the traditional worship of the Sumerian Anunnaki pantheon in the form of the so-titled Necronomicon, meaning Book of Dead Names. Before we discuss the correspondent Egyptian traits of the 50 Sanskrit letters, we must consider the impact of reducing the cards of the Lesser Arcana to the number of letters in the Sanskrit alphabet on the card deck known now as the Tarot. The first Tarot is dated to positive 1465 year Pythagoras from Padua, Italy, and was the work of painter Andreas Mantegna. It consisted of 50 plates of 10 anthropomorphic symbols in five sets. The first 40 of these correspond to the first 40 numbered cards in the usual deck. They signified the ten social statuses in class society, the nine muse daughters of Apollo and the sun god himself, the ten liberal arts and sciences of scholasticism, and the ten cardinal virtues of ordinal Catholicism. The final ten cards signified ten heavenly spheres, including the seven usual planets of contemporary astrology, as well as the primum mobile, or starred sphere, the prime mover, and the prima causa, symbolizing the supernal trinity of Catholic Christianity. These five sets, called decades, for having ten image plates in each, were the first authentically European card game, evolving by 1524 into basic trapola of 36 cards, from whence the modern 22 trumps and the 40-odd lesser arcana originate. While the notion of combining the 22 trumps with the 40 numbered cards 
to yield the same sum of attributes as the 64 hexagrams of I Ching ties the ideal tarot deck to the ancient Orient as well as the Mideast and Africa. The method of yielding the sum 72 by combining the 40 numbered cards and the 22 tarot trumps with 10 royal cards derives from a concept most sacred to Pythagoras, the famous pre-Greek mathematics cult leader. Pythagoras, who may have invented the standardized Phoenician, Hebrew, Greek alphabet of 22 letters, recognized that assigning number sums to each letter allowed one to apply mathematics, in which Pythagoras delighted, to the spelling of words and the constructions of sentences. The four Hebrew letter name of God, called the Tetragrammaton, consists of three letters, one repeated twice. Yod, Y, He, H, Vav, V or W, and He, H, again. Pythagoras was quick to note that, when assembled as a talisman on top of the Tetractus, one of Pythagoras' most favorite shapes, the letter's number sums for the Tetragrammaton added up to a magical number sacred to her Kabbalah. Yod, the tenth letter, plus Yod He, totaled 25, plus Yod He Va, totaled 46, plus the complete Tetragrammaton, totaling 26, would yield the magic sum of 72 by alphanumeric gematria. This pattern for the ten Sephiroth traits implies a Tetractus as a possible pattern for the ten royal cards necessary to bring the forty numbered cards up to the sum of the Mantegna Tarot, the names of Marduk, and to the letters of the Sanskrit alphabet. By adding ten to forty to yield fifty, and by adding twenty-two to fifty, we yield seventy-two. The seventy-two names and sigils of the Goetia that apply as ascendant, cadent, and decadent to each of the twelve signs of the zodiac are the spirits allegedly used by King Solomon to build the first temple to God in Jerusalem. However, they date to much older than this in origin. The Baal Shem, or name of God, of 216 letters as featured in the modern movie Pi, Faith in Chaos, derives from three verses in the book of Exodus, comprised of 72 letters each that describe the parting by Moses of the Red Sea. By taking these three columns as 72 rows, we derive 72 names of three letters each, the so-called Shem Ham Farash. However, the base 72 system originated prior to Moses leading the Hebrews in the Exodus out of Egypt, as evidenced by the so-called Bembine Tablet of Isis, dating from 1st century Rome, following after a lost Egyptian original. The Bembine Isis table is widely held, though rarely understood how, to represent the original version of a Tarot deck. It has three rows of 12, 5, and 12 characters surrounded around the edge by 72 hieroglyphs. The original intended meaning of the Bembine Isis tablet is untranslated. However, by applying the techniques described in this lecture of attributing the 22 letters to a hieroglyphic syllabary, we may begin to come closer to unlocking the ancient mysteries of the Torah.